Hello again, folks. I hope you're enjoying what we've been covering so far here at the Digital Transformation MEF event. Uh, we covered uh, best practices for IoT just now with Andrew Parking Y, and we're moving nicely into the next section, um, which is how can we actually monetize IoT, and what does that mean for both enterprises and telcos alike? You know, it's one thing to cover, you know, uh, connectivity, the ecosystem, but how can we make money for it with it? So uh, to help me, you know, answer those questions, I have a wonderful panel as well. I would like to introduce Mark Parker, the Managing Director of MetaB. Hello, Mark. Hi, hi. Good morning. Nelly in the afternoon already. Absolutely, absolutely. If you can give us a quick highlight of yourself and MetaB will be wonderful. Yeah, sure. We're a digital FM company. A lot of people say, what is that? And what that is, that's a traditional old school building optimization company that used to use people, but incorporates technology now, but very much underpinned by that customer experience side as well. So we have engineers that can do all the cool traditional stuff from an engineering point of view, but we can also digitalize your state as well. And we've got some real good examples of ROIs. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to bring on Afsan Mughal, who is the founder of IoTCreators.com, which is part of Deutsche Telekom. Afsan, welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, awesome to be here. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, all. So um, uh, I can be very short. I'm one of Mark's followers on, on, on uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> He's, 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 one, he's one of my influencers. Yeah. No, um, but um, um, yeah, I, I work for, um, I mean, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, you can see that I'm bragging a little bit. I call it founder at iotcreators.com. But actually, um, I'm employed by Deutsche Telekom, also known as T-Mobile in some countries. Uh, so I'm running a, a corporate startup to make uh, telco IoT services a little bit more uh, developer friendly. Fantastic. Thank you and welcome, Afzal. I would also like to bring Matthias uh, Mufelder from Emnify. Hello, Matthias. Hi, Nasia. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for inviting hi, hi. me for this panel. It's great being here. Looking forward to a fruitful conversation. <clears throat> and maybe also to share a few words about Emnify and myself. So I'm Senior Director of Partner Management at Emnify. And Emnify is an IoT connectivity um, provider, interconnectivity provider with a clear focus on cellular connectivity. And that means with a, you know, with a single pan of glass view on global cellular connectivity, our customers, organizations can deploy their IoT devices anywhere with a single SIM and of course manage it out of a single platform. And that all in the end means we reduce complexity in IoT device communication management and provide optimized connectivity, but also a comprehensive security and management capability. Great. Well, gentlemen, um, we have quite a session ahead of us, and this is how can we make this thing called Internet of Things IoT work and make us all some money. So uh, I think I will kick it off straight away and say that um, the ROI when it comes to uh, by ROI return on investment, um, IoT connected pro uh, products has been slow for a lot of folks. It has taken a while, especially if we look at it from the perspective of what the analyst expectation has been for the past, you know, quite a few years, if I may say so. But what does this really mean? And I'll come to you, Afso, because I know. Um, because I've been following your LinkedIn uh, as well, that uh, you're quite vocal about these things. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, um, I mean, this, this statement and question, it depends a little bit uh, from which angle of perspective you're looking at it, right? Because if we uh, look at it from uh, the perspective of an IoT solution provider like, uh, like Mark, then I don't fully agree with it because I think that there are many IoT use cases out there um, um, in which the uh, ROE is already uh, very promising and already uh, proven itself. 
Um, but on the uh, other hand, when you when you look at telcos, because had, we, we, we are discussing here the operator perspective, it simply means that uh, telcos and operators, they did not find any other value yet uh, besides selling connectivity or besides reselling IoT solutions from, from IoT solution providers. Well, I, I do believe that there is an opportunity for, for operators to, to add more value these days. You know, uh, um, a big company like Samsung, for example, um, um, they know how to build a device which, which runs on a mobile network. Yeah, and a company that makes POS systems like Honeywell, for example, they also know how to build a device and how to manage a device that, that runs on a, a mobile network. But if you um, uh, look at those companies who are making smart building solutions, street lighting solutions, parking sensors, yeah, or, or uh, devices to uh, track uh, elderly people who are um, uh, who are in who are suffering from uh, dementia, and we need to avoid that they are falling. You know, those those devices are not being made by Samsung or or, or Mercedes or Volkswagen or Honeywell. So those companies who um, um, who are building these devices, they are not used to build and manage devices that talk to a mobile network. Um, and I think that is where operators can add a huge value, uh, but that's what they're not doing yet. And that's indeed why there is no ROI yet. Okay, so um, operators should look at the long tail of IoT in order to bring in more value and monetize it faster. That's that's what I'm getting from what you're yeah. saying, Axel. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, companies like MetaB, uh, you know, have been able to successfully monetize and monetize IoT. And Mark, I mean, we're glad to have you here because I'm sure you have quite Thank a few you. use cases to share with us and some, you know, key insights. I, I do, and I have to um, just follow on from Afzal as well because that when I first had the questions and I saw. Um, it posed that the ROI for IoT is, is not in line with expectations from analysts. So I've, I've, well, two things came to mind. The first was, isn't it? Uh, and and the, the second one was, um, I, you can't trust what analysts predict with this stuff. Um, you know, I'd love to see what their models were predicting three, four, five years out. You know, they don't take into account of extreme events such as the, the pandemic or, or what's going on specifically with energy and and it's energy where um specifically ourselves have seen some we like to call them unicorn deals they're not there very often but they can be found um and what i mean by that is you don't need to be a rock star here to get some really cool and quick rois with iot technology all you need is something as simple and as cool as an energy management system a couple of sensors and connectivity to show what is going on with a client's energy bill digitalized in detailed and wonderful ways. Once you can do that, then you can then show that client how their assets on site are performing, either in hours, out of hours, which assets are working harder than they should be, which assets are coming on when they shouldn't be, et cetera. And very quickly, just by use of data, you can show them how they can make some very simple operational changes. But the ROIs are phenomenal if you look at some of these air handling units on sites for clients they're using in excess of two three four five megawatt hours out of their normal monthly parameter because when they were first initially installed um the client hasn't gone back and changed them based on the occupancy of the building post pandemic so if you can show them this with data and this is why we get very passionate about this side of it because i hate using hearsay or analyst recommendations i prefer to use fact and data that's right in front of me and with a digitalized energy bill i can show that client with fact and science exactly where that energy goes when it comes into their building but more importantly where they can target so they can get a very strong roi rather than pushing out through central comms departments initiatives such as we need to save more money or we need to be green you'll have a load of people on site going where where am i going what am i doing uh turn everything off whereas if i could say no 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 just focus on your chillers or focus on your ahus that again is just from an energy management system and stable connectivity and you can get some awesome roi so that's why i was a little bit bemused by 
the way that the question is posed from what the analysts have seen. The best way, just to finish it off, that I described to me, um, for getting engagement for ROI, um, it's more the pushback comes from on-site teams or on-site engineers that think the technology is going to uncover things that's going to make them lose their job or showing how yeah. naff they sh- they are because the technology is finding things that they just wouldn't be able to find. And this is where the technology needs to be positioned as an Iron Man suit that wraps around them to make them better rather than the Terminator that's going to come and kill them and wipe them all out. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> That, 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 that's key, I guess, because um, and, and it's not just, you know, on the areas where you've seen people be, are afraid on connected services and the insights of data analytics in general, because uh, the hidden data is what they're worrying about. Um, but uh, another point that you made, Mark, is people are worried or they've been told to um, create a more sustainable environment, you know, um, and, and business, I think, by looking at the areas where they can optimize automatically, you know, they will become more sustainable and greener by, you know, reducing uh, the expenditure of uh, on and, and the leakage in a lot of those systems, I would say. So, yeah, and, you, and you, you imagine it from a site team point of view. If you're the CEO and you look at your P&L and you go, oh, Jesus Christ, look at the costs this month or over the next sort of three months. I need to do something with it. Push this out. It's usually the guys and girls who are on site that don't know where to focus. So they need to look at technology. But again, they don't know where to focus. So this is where there needs to be very clear communication and engagement to understand that this isn't scary. This is actually quite straightforward but it can get some big returns and make you all look like rock stars. Mm -hmm, Indeed. And Matthias, uh, you you coming from the NVNO perspective, I would say, with NFI, so what's been your experience uh, around monetizing IoT? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, you know, um, following also what the the other two gentlemen, right, Afsal and Mark answered, um, I I can absolutely agree on that, but happy to also shed some light on how we see it. uh, one one thing up front, right? We we don't see ourselves as an MBNO, right? So we are the, the 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 connectivity provider and adding a ton of additional value to what an MBNO traditionally doesn't do. But um, I get it in terms of explaining it. So um, you, using that one, right, as a segue, uh, when when we talk about ROI and monetizing IoT, um, we we look at both sides, right? So we certainly um, we have our enterprise customers, right, who use our SIM cards in order to get the devices online, um, and they need to monetize this spend because they need to get something out of it. Because otherwise, guess why? What would they do it, right? Um, on the other hand, we are also dealing a lot with operators, right? And so in order to to, 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 make, to make it attractive also for them to open the networks for IoT needs, they also need an ROI out of that, right? So meaning we are, as the end connectivity provider in the middle of it, have really to look at both sides. So let me start with a few words on the enterprise side. On the enterprise side, right, what we really see is that ROI is coming out of the data. And Mark just spoke about, you know, focus and where to spend focus on and these type of things and making data-driven decisions. Um, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So the enterprises need to make data driven decisions and then they become the rock stars or the gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen um, within that organizations can become the rock stars because they take data driven decision. What brings whatever it is, right? The operational costs down, who drive efficiency. Um, so whatever they want to do with it, right? And this is now very, very broad and not down to a specific use case, but you can make data-driven decisions if you're using a connectivity platform, what gives you that data and also which is allowing you to integrate with all of the things you need as an enterprise in order to collect those data. Meaning whatever you get from a network, stream it somewhere, make decisions up on it and so on. And you know, automatically you will start making quite some, quite some return of investment out of it. What we see, and that a bit as a side note is, many, many IoT projects start small and then scale big, maybe even just after quite some time, right? So what you also need to provide to enterprises is basically a capability to allow them to run quick proof of concepts very, very quickly, and then give them a capability in order to scale it out globally, to really scale it up in terms to thousands, probably even millions of devices, right? So this flexibility to scale something up and down, that really, you know, is very, very efficient for the enterprises. 
On the operator side, operator side, I think is also interesting because, I mean, you know, we operate something what we call our super network. And with that, we have more than 450 major networks directly under contract here at Amnify, and that covers 180 countries. And when we, when we have conversation with those operators, um, many of them look at it as a pure wholesale model. And that's not necessarily how you can look at IoT connectivity, right? It's not just then you come into my network, I call you something, and then, you know, that's your rate and you multiply that. Because quite frankly, the one runs in whatever, you know, LTE router for whatever use case and blasts gigabytes of data. And the other one operates a narrowband IoT device and sends every second day whatever 20 kilobyte of data. So to put that all underneath exactly the same thing and say, okay, we deal with it like an like a standard wholesale rate, that's not necessarily always working. And to be creative and flexible also on the operator side, in order to discuss with us some in the connectivity provider some creative business models, helps them to monetize it, makes it attractive for the enterprise side, and so therefore you know we create an ecosystem and start a flywheel. Great. I see. I see you shaking your head, uh, absolutely uh, agreeing with what Matthias was just saying. So I'm going to ask to see if you had anything else to add to this. Yeah. Um, I mean, it makes absolutely sense. Uh, especially the last part. I can second that um, very strongly because, um, look, we were just talking about operators um, 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 and the ROI problem, right? When it comes to uh, IoT connected products. And then I said that uh, there are a lot of companies which are not Samsung, not Honeywell, not uh, Volkswagen. They are smaller companies building new devices. And um, there are two um, uh, values to add for, for, for an operator there. One is, it's very straightforward. It's consultancy and system integration when it comes to building these devices and managing these devices yeah, and connecting it to legacy systems of enterprises. But the other one is um, um, developers and engineering. I mean, everyone knows that people like, like, like engineers and developers are very scarce these days, right? Especially when it comes to those one with the specific knowledge to build things that talk to a mobile network. Yeah, that's even more niche than the developer and engineering ecosystem itself. So another thing that, that, that operators can do is they can uh, uh, basically uh, solve that problem. They can build something on top of their connectiv connectivity platforms that makes it easier for a broader group of developers and engineers. Yeah, let's simply say software developers. Yeah, so operators can build something to make it more accessible and easy for them to uh, build devices that talk to an operator network. And starting from that moment, an operator uh, makes uh, its entrance in the software world and they can sell software rather than, um, or device management, rather than connectivity only. So, uh, if, yeah. if, I, if I may add on this one, right, and, and I completely agree with you, Afsal, that's exactly how we see the world as well, right? So it's connectivity is one piece in it, right, in the whole IoT um, thing. But uh, it's not just, you know, it's, it's, it, it isn't done with just giving somebody connectivity and a SIM card, right? You need to give them options to integrate. You need to give them options to manage the SIM card. That all needs to be secure. That needs to be scalable. It needs to be manageable, right? Ideally, it also can be automated. And all these type of things is, A, what you said, right, Afsal, that's what developers love. And B, you become, with that, with offering that, a part of a digital supply chain, right? you're not just becoming a SIM card vendor, you're becoming a digital supply chain vendor, which then back to our monetization topic, can create value in whatever shape or form to the enterprises and on the other hand, of course, to the operators as well. Indeed, and yes. it's um, we're talking about moving up the value chain in order to get away from, from the commoditization of uh, just selling another IoT connectivity. And even that, you know, we can look at the business models to make it a little bit more part of palatable. Um, looking at it from the enterprise perspective, and I know, Mark, you've been working with your customers. What are some of the key business models that you come across? Um, when, um, you know, you and your customers are looking to uh, make money out of uh, IoT. Yeah, we, we, we love a subscription model um, just for, for, for many reasons, really. Um, more so 
because it adds that level of security from a payment point of view, from a basic point, from a basic standpoint, that um, a subscription model, if, if the client doesn't pay, you can just turn the data off. It's great power to be in, but not, not great conversations to have with an end client. Um, but for us, we, we normally structure our deals from a quite heavy capital investment up front in the first year, normally pays for the hardware, pays for labor, et cetera, to get the actual devices in sight and installed safely, which is a key point. I mean, I just said in terms of the developer side of it, um, there's loads of models out there where you can um, hire developer time um, at the moment. And also if you have developers that are sat within your business, you can, um, you know, if there's any dead time in their time zones and you can, you can then hire them out because there's people screaming out for that talent. But yeah, we normally front load capital spend in the first year and then years two and three on from that it's just a basic subscription model we've found we've, we've tried all sorts of different ways to do it um monthly subscriptions in year one um we've tried to um make a capital light um but we've just found that um for us first year heavy um and then twos and threes uh, are very light touch reporting and connectivity um you know, upsell opportunities uh, as a result of that access to the platforms and the data that works really well for us. And we found that our clients can can manage that quite well. Um, what, what, what the challenge is or what is a good challenge to have, I would say, is when you do a capital heavy um, model in the first year, um, most clients get to the end of their financial year and we, we, we've been flirting for the first 10 and 11 months around opportunities to put this technology in. And then they get to the end of the financial year and it's right, go, 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 go. I need to get this money out the door before the budget starts. And then it is a mad, mad rush to get kit on site. And then this way it comes down to that point that was made before around that digital supply chain um, to be able to make sure that is all in line and where it needs to be and very well structured for when you do run these models. Because for us, it's great, but also it can be a bit like pulling our lion's tail towards the end of the financial year. So we just have to structure that. Um, very carefully. Great insights here, uh, Mark. And, and Afzal, um, what kind of models have you seen uh, working quite well? Because you've seen it also from the operator perspective. Yeah. Um, so, so if I um, um, stick to what I, what I just said, uh, and sticking to the operator perspective or telco perspective, then it's um, license-based uh, connectivity. Uh, so basically a SIM is not only a SIM, but it's uh, also getting the data of the device directly in the endpoint of the customer. And you can do that in many different ways. And I saw that Amnify, uh, they have their own solutions uh, for that. Uh, I do have my own solution for that in IT creators. And I saw that other companies like Soracom, um, uh, uh, Once, and, and many others, I think Odomondo. But it also proves that uh, it looks a little bit... Um, bad for the for the MNO itself, right? <laughs> because I'm talking about companies who um, uh, provide SIMs and add something on top of that. But if I look from um, um, my perspective um, uh, on end-to-end -end solutions, then it's uh, it's similar to what Mark said, it's, it's subscriptions. Yeah, it's never like, uh, hey, we do we do a project for you and uh, we ask for, for an on-off, yeah, that one-off that maybe happens with POCs or, or pilots. Um, but what I see with my customers, um, and then I'm talking about customers who are um, providing water metering solutions to their customers or smart city solutions to their customers or some healthcare solutions, it's always service and subscription based. And usually they, they, they offer a device uh, with multiple sensors and um, um, to uh, basically enable uh, each sensor uh, the customer has to pay a little bit more and and that work works quite well indeed um I, and, and i can also add from my side of things what i've seen based on the discussions and projects that i've worked is uh, that the subscription model has been key and also like mark said is uh, getting um the hardware costs up front and the new trend that i'm seeing is actually uh, providing the hardware as a service as well so it's uh, it's uh, something that a lot of companies are looking into you could even do the models where you provide the hardware for free and i do air quotes if you can see that yeah. on camera and you, yes especially through shared savings deals etc you can um the client appears that well they are getting the technology funded by a very generous backer for free in the first year and then you take 
an 80-20 split on the energy savings as a result of that. that that's a different model. Um, quite difficult to do, um, a lot of moving parts, but it is um, a, a model that can be very fruitful for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should um, uh, look a little bit about how an organization is affected operationally when they're deploying you know, uh, IoT services, especially if you're talking about monetization. But the effect is not just external you know, with the customers or either the telcos or the enterprises is also internal and that has quite a big of an impact. So Matthias, um, what are, what is the impact that uh, an organization has when they looking at the operational models uh, when we're deploying IoT services? It's, I think it's a very, very interesting question because, you know, we saw several challenges with our customers, which they came across, right? So, um, in, in you know the earlier days of Amnify, we focused a lot also on what we call cloud native customers, right? So meaning the the you know the younger kids on the block, right? So they are building solutions, they understand cloud and 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 development and DevOps and all of that. So they came into it, and you know um, now all of a sudden had to manage connectivity as a resource which they have never had to deal with before. And they felt, oh my God, they need something like what now speaks all of this complex telco language and so on in order to even make something happen, right? So that was a challenge. You know, now they are providers like us and many, many others um, who are certainly, of course, you know, helping them in consuming these type of things easier. When we talk about bigger enterprises, what we also see meanwhile a lot is that these enterprises need to shift a lot in their entire mindset, how they are going after customers and how they are operating solutions. Because many of these guys, you know, take system integrators, for example, they so long build solutions and then just handed it over and had somebody else run it. Now, we spoke about MRI and recurring models, right, or MRC and recurring models. Everybody wants to get into this, right? So, but what does it mean from an operational perspective? Now you need to have a team inside your organization who looks at the metric, who concentrates if the service is still running and all of these type of things, right, present challenges to the, call it classical box movers, who someone just, you know, built something great, of course, right? But then shipped it over, lifted it, and somebody, you know, picked it up and had it run it from there. So meaning they need to reshape their entire organizational structure in order to also reflect the, what we call nowadays the DevOps model, right? You want to add for an MRR for a recurring fee. You want to add features every now and then. You need to operate it. You need to make sure it's running. Um, yeah. a, your your entire model down even to sales, right? Not just to a technical angle, but also to sales, who now needs to understand SaaS as a business model has to change. And that's quite some mindset shift in many, many organizations as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, gentlemen, it looks like we're running out of time. Um, this, I don't know, uh, the time flew. And this is a conversation that we could keep having for a very long time. However, I will still a little bit of time so we can close nicely. And if you can each give me your half a minute, you know, key thing when it comes to IoT monetization. And I'm going to start with you, Mark. Get on with it. Don't be scared. Um, keep your proof of concepts tight, but make sure that they are pointed to the right areas that you need to see the returns on and you know or you assume that you're going to get the returns on and then get them to scale. Just get after it. Don't be scared. Just do it. Afzal. Intrinsic motivation. That's the first thing that you need to take care of in your company, uh, especially the enterprise that wants to adopt IoT transformation before going to uh, a company like Mark or an operator with the question, can you IoT transformize my, my business? Make sure that everyone in your organization is intrinsically motivated to improve their business and to improve the work. Otherwise, it's going to get stuck. And Matthias? Yeah, so uh, I concentrate on the enterprise side, right? So um, I would say, dear enterprise customers, right? Look at, look at what you can do with the data, um, which you can get out of sensors, out of, you know, whatever a device, an IoT device is, you can install in the market. Um, drive that one, start small, scale it big, and, you know, take the money out of it. Great, great summary, gentlemen. Get into it, understand what it does to your company, start small and scale it, don't be afraid. Thank you, Afzal, Mark, and Matthias for joining me on this session. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care for now. Thank you.
Yeah. Bye-bye.